Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you just a tiny bit of background. So my wife, Christy, is my business partner. And so when I say we throughout most of this, it's Christy and I is who I mean. And, and then collectively, the we is all of us, our, our clients and our business partners, the people that we work with. Because I don't work in a vacuum, and we don't work in a vacuum. Every, it takes everybody together, the collective we, to produce what we do and to create these sculptures. And I'm going to scroll through some pictures here, too. I may be talking about them, may not be. Um, but but the, the limits are typically by building codes, um, environment, uh, the, the, the budget, and, and how people will interact with it. So the, the, that being said, there really aren't a lot of limits uh, mm -hmm. with it other than uh, you know, what, what your mind can come up with. And with this, this work in particular, you spent a lot of time kind of getting to know the people of Midlothian, and you wanted to make something that would really honor the, the people and also the industry in there. And so I'm curious about how materiality plays a role in that, and does the material help tell the story? And does the narrative, or does the narrative drive the material, or vice versa? Yeah, typically what, what Christy and I do is we tell stories through sculpture. And even though that's a big part of what we do today, we're talking mainly about materials. Um, in Midlothian, everybody knows it as this industrial town. It, most people don't know what it does, but when you drive out there, there are three very large cement factories. And most people hear the word concrete. They don't know that concrete is made up of cement and then the aggregates that you put in it, the, the concretes and things, or the, uh, the stones and the pebbles, that's what makes it, turns it into concrete. Um, but we made an active decision to work with the two large industries. One was steel, which is Gerdau Steel, and they have a very large closed circuit recycling and manufacturing plant, along with uh, the cement companies, and there's three major ones out there. And we met with all three of them, along with some old timers in the, the area, and really got a feel for what the, what the history was and what the in current environment was, and then tried to figure out a way to utilize all of those. All, all three cement companies, as well as Gerdau Steel, donated uh, either product or steel uh, to, to this this sculpture, which made it that more that much more special for the community and the and the owners and the people. Mm -hmm. So site specificity is obviously a, very important to your work. Um, but with public art commissions or when you're invited to make something, is that site chosen and then you adapt your work and your narrative around the site, or is it the other way around? Um, I, I'd say typically we're provided a couple of locations you know, that, that are obvious sometimes. Yeah. In particular on combination, I think I'll get to a picture here in a minute. Um, it, was, it was a water fountain that never worked. <laughs> and, it, and it leaked. And as you can see, they, the, the power that ran the water, it only went up about five feet when it probably should have gone up <laughs> around 15 feet to really make this nice. And then it has a big sign, you can't really read it, it says stay out. <laughs> so, it does say stay out of fountain, but it says stay out, and that was the first thing I saw. Mm -hmm. So it was obvious with the, uh, the hotel that was going in by Marty, he's here with Gatehouse Capital, um, we wanted to provide a connector between the two. Um, and so for this one, it was a very obvious space. This, this was the space to work in. A lot of times we're provided like a, a blueprint, and we're going through a project right now in South Carolina where they just gave us their entire layout and said, where do you suggest sculpture goes here? And you know, so we've given them about six locations that we think would be best to, one, create place-making opportunities along with uh, wayfinding and other experiential uh, opportunities. And then I have, a, you know, I have a couple of materials in mind based on the environment, the humidity. Um, there are alligators in the water there. You know, there's all kinds of things that you have to think about how someone's going to experience and what the material is going to do um, in those environments. And then sometimes people come in and say, this is the spot, I have a sculpture, I've got this budget, and I want it to be out of this material. Here's this pile of stuff I have, I want you to make it. Mm -hmm. And those are, uh, you have a little less freedom in those areas. Mm -hmm. And then this this work is a good example. We got to see the video and we got to hear a little bit about your collaboration with the community. And I think that plays a big part in site specificity as well. Um, because 
a work can be um, site specific, but it can be it can provoke anger or <laughs> hatred, like Richard Serra's Tilted Ark, o or it can be when you do it in kind of collaboration and in consultation with the community and understanding their desires and needs, very successful. So, at what point do you begin that? you know, collaboration with the community, how do you do it, what are the various ways that you ensure that what you're doing is actually going to be celebrated and, and enjoyed? Yeah, well, first off, I'd say it's sometimes a crapshoot whether it's going to be celebrated and enjoyed. <laughs> so you're, you're putting it out in the public and you, you do the most you can as far as research. Um, before we meet with a lot of people, we'd like to drive the area and sometimes just sit, you know, and experience what it is. Like Tom spoke to that, you know, you have to experience you know, climbing a mountain to know what kind of it feels like out there. Um, and then once you're there for a while and you start hearing the stories, if you go to the, the burger joint or the pizza joint, you, you hear the stories from people and then you know what kind of, you know, we try to always engage kids because they're our future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're lucky enough that with what Christy does through the creative and the writing and the story building, you know, she's able to work with a certain type of kids in there and then I'm able to work with the more hands-on type art, sometimes the engineering, things like that. Um, so you really try to engage those people. If you can't get to the kids, then you try to engage the leaders and some of the just normal people who are working in the environment and live there. Uh, it's not just the work, it, it is the people that live there because the, the moms and the kids are gonna come and be around this. And in particular, where this piece is, um, we thought about the, the name and the combination there's a lot of wedding venues at this, this event. You know, so we tried to think about what kind of a photograph you would get here in your wedding gown. Um, <laughs> we've yet to have anybody send one. I think we're maybe in the spring we'll it's have close. some. <laughs> um, but it's, it's like that. And you can see the maquette here. We usually try to, especially on a piece like this, I, uh, and I'll do this real quickly, I, we used balsa wood to sculpt an I-beam and then I molded it and I, I made a piece of plastic that I could manipulate. And in the video, you saw a really kind of corrugated piece of white plastic. That was trying to bend it after it had already uh, solidified. So, but what we figured out is there was a period of time we could do it before it solidified to create the piece. And we were able to match it pretty closely. And that, that sometimes doesn't happen. Sometimes it takes the model and then <laughs> you go into what the limits of the material you, allow you to do. And do you do most of the fabrication in your studio, downtown Dallas, or when there's a project that's not in your studio? How does um, that happen? We, we try to utilize uh, factories and foundries and fabricators close to the locations we, in, we, we are in or in the country that we work in. Mm -hmm. And that, that does a couple of things. One is it, it helps with the logistics of moving large pieces. The other is, is it helps uh, community sort of ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, like we did a 14-foot tall Wayne Gretzky sculpture up in Brantford and it's hard enough an American artist doing an, a Canadian icon, you know, so we tried to use a foundry in, in Toronto and do as much of the work up there as we could and that, that helped. Mm -hmm. But this, this piece is, uh, these aren't just rolled pieces, these are rolled and twisted very structural eye beams, very, very complicated. That's my dog, Pete. He, <laughs> he comes to work every day. So if you come down to the studio, he'll be there mostly. And he's with me when I take road trips. And he's a good road dog. Um, and that's, that's kind of the fun thing. Uh, we've started incorporating time capsules. Uh, we didn't get to do it on this project. But in future, the plate like this will have a time capsule underneath it. And that's the mayor and all the other people that are involved in it will have things in it. And uh, we gave the mayor the, the wrench to the city instead of the key to the city. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get to the traveling man. I think anybody who lives in Dallas um, is very familiar with this work. Um, it's iconic. It kind of greets you as you cross over into the entertainment district known as Deep Ellum. And um, it's just, this, how tall is this? this uh, is we list him at 38 feet. I think he's about 39 feet. and a half with his antennas. Uh, <laughs> with their lightning <laughs> and, protection. And it's, three, it's a series of three. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this commission and how it differed from the Midlothian Commission. Yeah, so 
the Midlothian Commission, we were asked to come out and be a part of that community. And they didn't just say, here's a budget and come out and make this sculpture for us. We really had to work and help them understand what the process is and, and sort of walk them through all that and educate a lot of different people on how that works. Um, and then we presented the design and then we were lucky enough that the uh, Board of Commissioners, everybody approved it and then we were able to proceed. DART, on the other hand, was a public call and it was narrowed down to six uh, artist groups. Uh, I think one was out of Canada, a couple from Middle America, and then a couple from Dallas. And Real Effects, which is a uh, animated movie in a movie studio, they, Brandon Oldenburg was a good friend of mine and we had worked together on a couple things and so he put together the package and included us in it. We were part of that and we were part of the six. And then he called me one day and said, hey, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I put your name in this, and, and we were selected in the final six. And so that being said, then, then we got to work together and actually come up with the designs. And uh, it was a lot of work, and DART was a committee of 12, uh, 12 very yes, different people. <laughs> and So consensus was really easy to come by. Yeah, not at all. There, the, the, the meetings were yelling and crying and lots of uh, upset. Um, and it was really hard to get this pushed through. Uh, we, we got selected, but then when they saw what it was, it, it was really tough. And I think in hindsight, everybody's like, yeah, it works, and it was really great. But at the time, there was a lot of comments, you know, why are we going to put a robot here? And <laughs> why is that, you know, lots of whys. Mm -hmm. um, but Brandon, having worked down there, and I wasn't far, we really felt like the, the history of this, and Christy, too, Christy was in, instrumental in the story on this, that this, this giant iconic piece had these smaller uh, mirror finished birds. The birds represent the entrepreneurs, the business people, the musicians, uh, the artists of Deep Ellum and its rich history. And their mirror finish is so that you can be, be a part of the past. You can see yourself in it. So the material selection there was, it was pretty obvious what it needed to be once we figured out what we were doing because stainless steel is, it's a medical grade uh, it's very industrial and holds up really well. These pieces have been out there since 2009, so eight years now almost. Mm -hmm. And there's very few scratches on them. Um, the big piece, he has actually two bullet um, dents oh. in it, but it didn't pierce it. They're just small dents. Um, you know, and, and can't really help that, but, but it's, it's made of uh, very strong pieces. This will withhold a 150 mile an hour wind shear. It's going to be here probably longer than any of the buildings. That's something also nobody really thinks about is how do you make a work of art that's going to withstand the climate and, and the environment in which it's located? And living in Dallas, we get everything. We get tornadoes. We get sleep. We get, you know, we haven't got a hurricane yet, but maybe. Hopefully not. <laughs> well, the, the, that's a part of my background, my history, and my experience, you know, Tom was talking about 10,000 hours, and I was trying to add up how many hours I have. I know yours is probably well more than 20,000 now, um, and I think I'm close to that as well on this. And that's understanding the materials and how they can be used and manipulated, but also how they weather, how they hold up, and how a person is going to engage with them. Um, but then on the back of that, I'm sure there's at least one engineer in here. Um, you really rely on those engineers to crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the packet of, of number crunching on this is about an inch and a half thick. Um, not necessarily wow. this piece, but the Wait. tall guy it is. Um, there are the birds. Yeah, there's the, the iconic birds. And uh, <laughs> they're actually seats. I, I remember the day after we pulled all the construction fences, I, there was a 7-Eleven across the street still there. But I saw a guy sitting on the back of this bird on the right, and he was eating a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> that cracked me up. Um, you mentioned engineering, and can you talk a little bit about the engineering of this? Yeah, it took us uh, six months to work the, the details of this out. And I, I was a little frustrated that it took that long because I didn't understand at the time why it was taking so long. But understanding that you have over 35,000 pounds above ground and another 30,000 pounds below ground mm. to keep this thing from moving or falling on anybody, uh, it, it takes a lot of testing and, and understanding of what materials, like the, the internal structure, the bones of the traveling man is the, the upper portions are made out of a combination of five-eighths 
uh, 588 steel, which is basically core 10. Mm -hmm. And then at the very bottom, it goes into one and a half inch thick steel. What you think about that, a piece of steel this big, you know, a square foot, one and a half inch thick is about 90 pounds. So you don't just like move that around easily. Um, and there's not a factory that just makes this stuff. So I, I sent, I, I thought, all right, I'm gonna do this different than any other project I've done. I'm actually gonna send this out. I'm gonna get quotes on this. <laughs> And so I found one company back east and another, like in uh, Connecticut and another one not far from here. And I sent it out and the first quote for just the bones of the one traveling man, the tall guy, walking tall, uh, was $900,000. What and was what the budget that, of the show? Yeah, it was $1.4 million for all three <laughs> locations. <laughs> so in my mind, I was like, well, I guess he could be 12 feet tall. <laughs> um, but then what I quickly realized is these people didn't know what they were quoting. Um, and it wasn't for their lack of trying to understand it. It was just they were scared and had never done it before and didn't really understand it. So that's where I had to pull it back in and work with some guys that I know and make them understand what it was. And then we just took it over. We rented a house, or not a house, but a, a little warehouse in Sulphur Springs and mm -hmm. bought the right equipment and built it for about $220,000. Just the bones. Yeah, just the bones. So we're looking at a, a few of the original renderings that Brandon did, uh, really fun, fun, playful renderings. And then we'll get into um, some sketches that we did to try to figure out how the, the bones work and how the skin can apply. Mm -hmm. And the internal structures are like, the one in the middle that has the conical with the clips off it, that's actually a technique that we used. Um, each piece had to be hand drilled and there's over 10,000 rivets in the big guy. Hmm. And then you get into, this. these are really cool because this is part of the engineering and the layout and the, the programming. Um, that's a lot of different pieces. <laughs> and so like to have one piece not fit you don't just magically trim that piece up. You had to go back and get a new piece make, mm -hmm. made and understand the, the math and the conical. And this is, like Tom was talking about how machines build stuff. Machines laid this out and actually cut it and drilled part of it, but then it takes a person by hand feeding this into a roller, putting the conical shape, putting the 10 rivets in down one side and then trying to manipulate it back in place to get the other 10 on the other side to go in. So it, it's, it took uh, four guys. One guy was my employee, he's been with me for 23 years, and then LM Fabrications locally, him and one of, two of his guys, they were on site about seven weeks putting the skin on the traveling man. Hmm. And that just happened to be end of June through August 9th here in Texas. <laughs> so the, and this is, you know, you talk about material usage, there wasn't really any other material we could use, but we put a thermometer on one of those pieces out there. It was 140 degrees. Oh my gosh. Um, but when you got above about 14 feet in the air, there was a nice breeze. <laughs> so we were, we were working sort of in a, in a little wind zone. Hmm. We were just talking before this about installation and at the Nasher, you know, we, we deal with large scale sculptures all the time. And um, when we're putting work in the garden, we now have to, if it's large enough, like the Giuseppe Pannone tree we put in last fall, we have to have a crane kind of park itself outside of our wall. And then it's lifted from the flatbed over the garden wall and into its location which is terrifying because this is a huge sculpture that's just suspended in air, like being gracefully placed. And so we're talking about when we did that installation, a lot of things just weren't going so well and it ended up you know, three or four in the morning before we actually finished it. And you had a great story about this particular installation um, because I think you, you, you just can't shut down if it's, if it's a problem, you can't say, well, we'll just leave it on the crane and come back tomorrow. Yeah, like this, this <laughs> photograph here, this is from about May, no, it's, it's about June 6th that day. Um, and that's middle of the summer, that's about 8.45 at night. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the other side of that leg there. We had the, the rear leg stuck and we couldn't get that front leg stuck. Uh, when I say stuck, I mean over the eight bolts that, that are in the ground. We could always get three or four of them, but we could never get all, all eight of them at the same time. And we finally got it 
in the ground, you know, over the eight bolts around midnight, and it took us another two or three hours to actually tighten all of them down. Because again, you don't just have this magic drill that you put over it and it just tightens everything up. It's all done by hand, and the hole that that's in is about uh, eight feet diameter with a 54 inch diameter pier and about six feet around that that has a rebar cage that's gonna be backfilled with concrete to lock it all together. So you're working inside the rebar, only able to move a wrench maybe six inches before you have to take it off and move it back again. And so, and you're wearing a hard hat and all the other protective stuff and trying not to get beat up and cut and banged and it's inevitable you do. So that's what Tom was talking about too, that the artist does it. I, I don't get to just stand on the side and say, hey, just figure out how to stick that thing in the ground. You know, right. you guys do it. It's when it comes down to it, if we have a problem, I have to make the decision on how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I don't do it by myself. We, we have engineers, we, we have people there, but we couldn't leave that up in the air. We had, to, we had to safely put it there because the hydraulics on the cranes, you can't leave the tension on them for that long. And there's all, all kinds of safety issues that you gotta make sure everybody, everybody stays safe. So how much time passed from concept to installation and then also how much changes in that period of time? Is there? Well, like on the Traveling Man, the project was uh, two years all in. Okay. And I'd say it was around six to nine months of design, mm -hmm. another six, six months of engineering, and then the fabrication started in January and we installed in, in, in August. August 9th, we walked off site. Wow. So it was a relatively quick yeah. fabrication for something like that. But that's, that's one of our trademarks that we, we fabricate very quickly. Like if you take combination, for example, mm -hmm. it took us longer to develop the relationship and the design than it did to fabricate. We, we started, we got the go ahead on design in September and we installed that January 20, 22nd, 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's ridiculous for the amount of work that that project actually was. How did you incorporate the Deep Elm history into this particular project? That's the fun part of a lot of our <laughs> projects. Um, where you get to go in and, and become a part of it and kind of research the past and, and the history, uh, you feel like you're a part of it after that. It's, it's like reading a really great book or watching a great movie. Um, there's great resources at the library and then if you can find somebody who's kind of lived long enough to, mm -hmm. to share part of it with you as well. And Deep Ellum has a rich history so there's a lot documented on it. Mm -hmm. And the different, and the traveling man in particular, what is, what is, hit, what is about that figure how did you come to that figure, I suppose? Oh, it was lots of, the, the original maquette we did was very sort of a 1912 locomotive with like doors that opened in his chest and it was really kind of industrial feeling. Mm -hmm. And so we refined it into a bit of modern art for the reason of we wanted to make it a piece of artwork versus, excuse me, just um, sticking something up that looked like found art. Uh, and it had to be refined enough so that as the future uh, developed around it, it still blended in with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's just so fun to, to do that research. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say Christy does most of the research and then it's sort of like when I get up in the morning and the paper's been read and she hands me the parts that are really good for me to, <laughs> to read. Well, I think research played a big part in the next project that we have. Well, yeah. so before few, we get there, let's see. A few see extra pictures. Them. That's They had a time lapse that showed part of the traveling man, and then it had a glitch and didn't catch all of it. But it was supposed to catch the application of all the skin. Wow. And then the finished product. Uh, people, if you drive by this, there's always somebody down there photographing. Mm -hmm. In the snow. Just a, that's a good example, though, of with standing yeah. the environment. This is the, the two tattoos is a, a, a mom and a son. <laughs> and uh, they were nice enough to share that with us. And the Geico was on the Chase Bank website. And up there with the shoes and the scarf, that was a, a, a girl who just felt sad that he looked cold. <laughs> so she made those, they're Chuck Taylor shoes. And, But then you're talking about research. This is a piece called The Birth of a City. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, first of all, this is just what the commission is, where it's located, and? Yeah, this is at Encore Park, which is not far from here. You could actually walk there uh, about a 
10 or 15 minute walk. Uh, it's right across the street from the stew pot. So it's essentially in Dallas, it's ground zero for the homeless issue that we have here. And it's right across the street from First Presbyterian Church, which Christy and I are members of. Um, but for those of you who don't know, 508 Park, uh, which is the building there, the old Warner Brothers Exchange, was a recording studio and is very famous mainly because Robert Johnson, who is a great uh, blues musician, it was the last place he recorded an album. He died two weeks after. Um, and so it became famous for that. People from all over the world come and stand out in front of this building and kind of admire it. And then um, we got the opportunity to help provide a sculpture here. And we knew the architecture of the building. And they told us about where this was going to go. So it wasn't like they just said, put sculpture somewhere in here. They said, it's going to be on the wall. And it needs to be on the exterior so that it's not exclu exclusive. It, it's inclusive to the outside and the inside. And there are, you can't really see it from this picture, but there's gaps in the wall. They're small enough that you can't crawl through, but they're big enough that you can hear all the music and things that go through the amphitheater that's on the inside of this. And this is a 16-panel relief. It's, it is called The Birth of a City. It's from the inception of Dallas in about 1856 to about 1937. Um, and we tried to include almost every sort of aspect of what we could discover. Mm -hmm. And they're inspired by the uh, lost post office office murals by Alexander Hogue and uh, Jerry Bywater. Mm -hmm. And these are cast in bronze. Um, I had, uh, I sculpted a lot on this, but I had other artists that helped me with it. It, it was too big of a project to turn quick, and we did turn that one quick. We, we sculpted it all over a summer. Um, this is one of the murals. And Robert Johnson. Um, so murals are part of this long tradition of storytelling, combining architecture and narrative elements. And so this element of visual narrative is the basis of your collaboration and your relationship with Christy. She's, she's your partner, and she comes to all of your projects through kind of written word, creative writing, to help you develop that narrative. So this is kind of natural. Like, that collaboration seems very natural when it comes to a mural project, because that's the whole point. But I'm wondering if you could talk about how the written word and the narrative plays a role in other projects that you two have worked on. Yeah, well, it's the, the, the written wor word is what comes first for Christy. Um, what comes first for me is always visual. And so I'm a very, my, my mind is very animated. So whenever Christy is writing or talking about something, images come in my mind. And the same thing is like, like reading a book is like watching a movie for me. Um, and that's, that's where this, we, Sometimes I'll come up with an idea and I'll tell it to Christy and she'll enhance it, or other times she will come up with it and talk to me and then we kind of work through a direction. Um, or sometimes she writes the whole story and then says, here's what I have. Um, and then it's, then I kind of go back and forth and play around with it. But the, the written word is, is really, the, if it's not the beginning point, it should be the beginning point mm -hmm. on all of what we do because it helps lay out a pathway for which we can get to the end result. Mm -hmm. And even like this, this drawing that you're looking at on this table, that was, it was scaled uh, one, I think it was uh, 12 inches to one foot, or I, I mean, uh, one inch to 12, one inch to one foot. Um, but you can see the packet of writing there. Each little panel had a full page with backup photos and inspiration. And this sculpture in particular was one that made us feel like we were closer to the city of Dallas after we did it. You know, we're both transplants here. We didn't grow up in Dallas, but we really feel like we're part of Dallas now because of this sculpture. What was the driving choice for bronze as your material? Um, one, the, the way it ages. Bronze is a material that it's going to be around unless somebody cuts it up and melts it down. Mm -hmm. um, it weathers well. It holds up to uh, rubbing by hand. Uh, the patina riches, gets richer over time. Mm -hmm. This particular piece has an anti-graffiti coating on it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we sculpted this all as one big mural and then cut it apart. Um, Can you walk us through that kind of yeah. not too in depth, yeah. but maybe a step by step, like well, the, the, for this the one we well, it comes the the written and then the, the sketch, mm -hmm. and then we took the sketch and we actually blew it up life size for this one mm -hmm. because it wasn't too big. Mm -hmm. um, when you're like the guys from Icon, when they do these big murals on the buildings, they actually have small small drawings that are laid out in grids, and they know that this grid is four feet by five feet, and they work at it that way. This one, 
what we do is we lay the paper up on a wall of clay that we've created, and you can basically take a pen and poke through it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going by pictures after that. You're actually hand applying clay and building it up and creating noses and eyes. And, and you do the rough outline of the entire thing, and then you come back in and do all the fine work, the detail work, and the takeaway. And then you go to bed for a couple days, and then you <laughs> come, come back and look at it again and realize that you're a long ways from being done. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's pretty hot you know, where we sculpted this, and you, you don't get the option of picking the best time of the year to do things. They're, they're based off of when the, the jobs are opening and yeah. projects are completing. This is us moving it. The cool thing about when we installed this is this is right across the street from Homeless. There was a couple of guys that had hard hats and vests, and they're like, hey, I want to help. And uh, so we ended up, I just gave them money out of my pocket at the end, but they're, they didn't have jobs, and they didn't have homes, and I don't even know where they got the vest, but <laughs> they were there helping. Uh, and they're pretty heavy. These panels, um, they weigh a, a, approximately 280 pounds each. Mm -hmm. And they're, we, we put a, a filler on the back just to keep any moisture from coming through. And they're inset into there. And then we used a, a pick-proof caulk mm. uh, around the edges so that somebody couldn't come and kind of dig it out and then try it. We knew they wouldn't be able to get them out, but we didn't want somebody to damage it trying to get it out. Because they have four uh, one-inch threaded rods that go into the wall. So the wall is going to come down before the piece is going to come out. <laughs> and then the day we opened it, uh, we got to talk about it and give a great tour. And it was really fun. Christy's way better at explaining the story than I am. <laughs> This, just right after this, the mayor gave me this really awkward hug. I wasn't expecting <laughs> him to hug me, so I was like, <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> but on, on Young Street, um, come, just coming up from uh, City Hall, there are six panels on the wall that are sort of pullouts of the big long wall. Mm -hmm. Each one has the description. You know, it's Alexander Hogan, Jerry Bywater mm -hmm. uh, working on some of their murals. Um, there, they, there they are in, in the actual mural. And then we skipped a skater bird. Skater Bird. Skater Bird is this, you can probably see it if you walk out of the Nasher and get yourself to Ross Avenue and just look south? West. 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 Towards uh, the west end. Towards anyway. the west end. And it's on top of a building and it was really kind of this signal that you had moved your studio from the design district into downtown. And it became this kind of sign announcing your arrival. But it's also a sign or a symbol on top of a building, which to me makes me think also of the Pegasus in Dallas and how this was a symbol for an oil company and it became a symbol for Dallas. And I'm just wondering how you see your work in relation to the more historical symbols in Dallas. Well, having, having worked on approximately 40 courthouses in Texas, yes. doing historical restoration work, I'm very respectful of taking things back to what they originally were. And the craftsmanship that went into that is really, really intense. And, and you're not able to do a lot of stuff. People who are doing historical restoration, they understand that it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's expensive because it takes a lot of hand hours. You don't get to do it with, with machinery. Or if you do, it's the old guy that knows how to work this one lathe or whatever. And it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that and respecting the history, and sticking a piece, like when I say stick, I don't mean stick. I mean <laughs> installing um, a you don't sculpture. Stick that yeah. On top of well, <laughs> stick is a, uh, a term. Skateboarding no, it's a term we use. What well, is skateboarding too? But it's a term we use in sort of big steel. Okay. You, 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 and when you're using cranes and things, you stick it where it's supposed to go. So I, I have been using that a lot because we've been using some cranes and other things lately. <laughs> Um, but installing Skater Bird on the roof, um, it was part of it was we wanted to make our, our mark in the city and just an incredible opportunity to put it in the skyline of Dallas because there's really, there's only three pieces in the skyline that I know of. One mm -hmm. is this spinning flower part over in the West End mm -hmm. that doesn't spin very much, so I don't really understand why it's not, <laughs> haven't been up there. And then the, Peg the Pegasus and then the Skater Bird. And, Rather than put a, a sign on the street, we felt like it was important to just put it in the skyline because we felt like moving down in downtown Dallas was a really big step for us. It was that leap of faith of, do we you know, continue what we're doing? Do we go get a job? Do we just kind of work along? You know, 
in other routes, or do we go make a big statement and try to make a big business out of this? Mm -hmm. And our store is directly below that. Um, you know, we're at a museum here. You have your your store up there, which actually Christy has these tiny sparks that she sculpts. They're available upstairs in the store here, so they're very nice collaboration. Go here. check them out um, for sale. <laughs> and uh, but we we try to make smaller versions of our bigger sculpture, like Skaterbird. We have a four inch and a seven inch version that because you can't afford to buy one of these and stick it in your backyard. We try to make other pieces that, if people really enjoy the piece, just like there's great pieces in you know Henry Moore in the back. I wish there were Henry Moores for sale in the gift shop, because I would buy them. We all would. <laughs> yeah. um, but so keeping that in mind, we try to make that where some people can enjoy these in their own home and make a part of Dallas a part of their home, too. Um, that's a great shot. So this is actually a photograph Christy was driving, and I was in the passenger seat, and we were on Woodall Rogers, and I shot past her with a camera and took a picture of the garage. And that's superimposed. This is digital. Um, so if you look at, that's our original rendering, and if I had a same shot of Skaterbird from, from the bridge, it looks so similar. We just added his sort of cool hair <laughs> and raised up the skateboard a little bit. Oh, uh, why a skateboarder? Um, Do you well, skateboard? We, I, I, not very well. <laughs> um, but when we were up on the, on the, on the top of the roof, it's, you know, parking garages are, are ramped. Mm -hmm. And we were up there, I was like, oh, how cool would it be to have like something up here, you know, like a bird jumping into the city. And then later on, we found out that this garage has been an iconic skateboarding garage yeah. for 30 years. The day after we installed this piece, we, we walked off site at 2 o'clock on a Saturday, got it up. Before noon on Sunday, there was a photograph of nine skateboarders standing all up, ready to fall off the building, um, <laughs> and wrote us this long paragraph email about how they felt like the skateboard gods had answered their prayers. <laughs> and so it was, it was that, that's immediate validation that we did something that can be appreciated by the environment that it's in mm. and, and place-making opportunities. And same thing with Traveling Man. When we took the fences off, I think it was around 10 in the morning, we came back at 3 for a drive through on the train. There was a husband and wife in a wedding gown and tuxedo um, waiting on the train, taking their wedding pictures that day. Wow. Four hours. <laughs> and that's just, I don't think many artists get that validation so fast. Mm. This is some process pictures. People don't understand how these things are made there. You build a frame, and basically you hand hammer all of the metal into the shape. Uh, sometimes into a fiberglass mold, but sometimes just hammer it, stick it, hammer it, stick it, and keep, keep doing that until you get it right. Wow. That's his hair, his cool skater bird. So that's, <laughs> that's his sculpted piece. That's a piece of fiberglass, and you can see the wheels from the skateboard around it. Um, so we basically we cut, that, that would have been uh, the, the hair would have been made in about uh, nine or 11, nine to 11 pieces. So you shape them around that. You can't really have an undercut and then get it back off. So you cut the piece and then you weld it all up, sand it, polish it. My daughter, Annabelle, <laughs> um, she's uh, at a lot of our installs and supports us. So the bird, we, we assembled it finally down in the parking lot and the crane and by the time it started lifting and I got upstairs. It was already upstairs. It was a very quick lift. Yeah. And uh, community involvement, uh, although we didn't involve a lot of community in this, the Fountain Place building, uh, Tenant Health is a big occupant of that. One of the girls who runs the marketing department there filmed this going up. And within 20 minutes of us having it on the roof, she had emailed Christy. And so we had a video of Skaterbird being lifted up on the roof. You also held a skateboard competition? Yeah, it was called D-Town Throwdown. And we, we just, we had a relationship with Red Bull and we called them to see if we could just get some skateboarders up there. And it turned into this massive 5,000 person event with a big skateboard race through the garage and street bikes and tricks and all kinds of stuff. And I think they'll do it again in a couple of years. We just did it uh, last year for the first time. And, but it was, it was a good event, mm -hmm. it was fun. And that helps people buy into it. I think the, one of the next steps is hopefully over the next year we can get a, a smaller version of a skater bird, maybe a four or five foot version on the ground mm -hmm. somewhere in Dallas so that people can engage with it a little easier because the building's locked over the weekend. It's kind of hard to get up there, mm -hmm. although the skateboarders have figured that part out. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's Fine flying to here. his landing spot. And again, another case of engineers 
helping me understand you know, what we need to do to make it structural and how to bolt it down and mm -hmm. how that works. That's the, that's the picture, isn't it? It's the yeah, picture. that's the picture of the guys. <laughs> yeah. So there's there the D-Town throwdown. And then some of the smaller versions and you know, some of the marketing. We try to uh, help the people who own our sculptures understand that the, the community buy-in is important and help them engage with that as well so by balloons and posters and T-shirts. <laughs> So it's really great at sunset. You get a view of the entire South Oak Cliff, and uh, you can see Texas Stadium from here on a, on a clear night. It's it's really good. So then we get into another piece. Um, Chicago Works, which I think relates nicely to Birth of a City, but one thing that's pertinent to a discussion of materiality is you use different materials. Mm -hmm. Even though they look somewhat similar, it's also a relief sculpture. It's also... Um, putting on display the history of a city. Um, but I'm curious why, can you tell us about this material and why the choice was made to do it? Yeah, so this is Strategic Hotels. They're a, a client of mine. I've worked on about eight of their properties. And this tube structure that you see here existed. And there was an LED sign in there that at night lit up the entire block and became a big problem with all the neighbors, and they had to <laughs> remove it. Um, and they got, they got permission to put it up because it was just information about the hotel, and then they started advertising, and that was the final straw. Um, but because this structure existed, the entire thing is out of aluminum, and it's on its own base. I had to stay within sort of the weight zones that the LEDs were in, and so we cast these out of aluminum. Um, and the LEDs were in that same sort of stair-step pattern, um, so I cast this piece in three different sections, and they bolt together. And uh, I think there might be a couple pictures. Uh, but we started off back in the, in the 1920s, the WP area. We were, I know Christy and I both have an affinity for that, that work, because it's, it's realism, but it's sort of exaggerated. You know, you get to balloon it, you get to enhance it, make it a lot more fun than just sculpting a real person is, at least for me, anyway. <laughs> um, but we start off with a sketch. And then we sculpted a small version. And the small version helps us work out the details and sort of the angles and how big something needs to come off the, build, the, the wall. Um, and then from that, I enlarged it. And uh, I think there's a couple of pictures on how big it actually is. Mm -hmm. It's about 12 feet tall. That's the Wrigley Building in Chicago. Um, and <coughs> just kind of a little bit of sculpting. And you get, it's really it makes you very sore and tired to sculpt uh, on scaffolding or on ladders and on vertical surfaces. It's a lot easier to work on one, one little piece on a little Lazy Susan that you can turn around or hold in your lap. But this big stuff, you, you really get tired doing the work. And dirty. Uh, um, but then this is the, the process of installing. So these are cast in aluminum, but then we used, uh, and I can't remember the exact term, but it's an alkaloid uh, exterior UV stable uh, clear coat, but we used bronze powders and other copper powders in it to get the look. And then this is where we were sticking that piece in. <laughs> um, but these are tricky too because I took all the measurements. This is supposed to be on a 120 foot radius, um, but then the pieces flared out a little bit, so we end up having to cut, manipulate. It's a typical install of it doesn't quite fit exactly how you think it's going to. But uh, our job is to get it up, and that's what we did. Yeah. And so this particular picture, you see all the little starbursts. From a period of about 7.50 in the morning to about 8.25, the sun peeks out over these buildings and hits the mirror tops on the buildings behind it, and it lit up this side. And uh, I was able to get these, a couple of these pictures with the Fairmont in it, too. And then. Uh, <laughs> We get into the next series. Your wild crop series, yeah. which you want to tell us how yeah, this so, came about? So Christy and I, are we, we walk our dog Pete a lot. And mm -hmm. on those walks, we talk a lot about things. And although I don't see it exactly this way, Christy feels like I am my sculpture. <laughs> and I have to agree, I guess I am. But um, I just get ideas a lot of the time. And we started talking about what kind of uh, iconic sculpture we could come up with. And 
Christy spearheaded the conversation and we had our kids involved with it. And then we started talking about maybe chairs and shoes or uh, this furniture and that furniture. And so what we came up with was uh, wild animals and uh, fruits and vegetables. And so that's where the, the wild crops came about. So you have the paraffin in the back, you have temptation uh, apple, the rhino beet, and in the back is the strutting artichoke. Each one is sort of modeled after a character like strutting artichoke is Rod Stewart. <laughs> Um, sweet carrots, each, co each one comes with a quote, and Christy wrote these, and it's, uh, may your words be as light as a sparrow and as sweet as a carrot, for tomorrow you may need to eat them. <laughs> but again, it comes in a material. We took the sweet carrot, and there's an installation we're going to be installing in January, February, over at Clear Fork in Fort Worth, um, where this is going to be 11 feet tall. And this is the, the beginning process of how we go about turning something from small scale into a, a larger scale. That's wood and a lot of masking tape and tin foil <laughs> and a lot of steel within it. And then we used a product called uh, Freeform Air, which uh, hardens. It's sort of like a, an air drying putty, but it it's, dries quicker. And then we used another product. There's the tail. Um, another product called uh, Freeform habitat, which is made to use zoo habitats. Hmm. Um, so it's a very hard industrial. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to do the sculpting. And we're going to make a mold on this, and we'll cast the bronze that'll go on clear for it. But then I can take this model and put a faux finish on it and stick it in my display window at my store. Um, so it furthers the development. There's not just one out there. There's two out there. People can ask about it. I can say you can go see the real one. You can sit on it and engage with it and buy the small one to take with you. So I think in closing, I just have one last question. You've been in your downtown studio for how long? Two years now. Two years. So how does having your studio and a fabrications studio right next door to your showroom, all of that being located in downtown Dallas, how has that changed your relationship with the city? Um, I, I think it's, it's made me a part of the city. It's made us a part of the city. Uh, and I think everybody appreciates what we do down there. and, and really likes the fact, like you, you have other, other towns, you know, Seattle, for instance, the, the grunge movement started out there, and the music, music and the coffee, that's part of it. Dallas, other than Deep Ellum, doesn't really have that thing yet mm -hmm. that's down there. And we, we were brought into that space to try to activate that area, because where we are between Field and Griffin and, and just in that lower section, there's, there's no name for that part of the city. If you look at the city map, it's got the West End, and it's got the Arts District, and then I can't even remember the name of what they call that down there, but it's, it's inconsequential. Mm -hmm. and so we're, we're trying to help create a, a personality down there, and I think we've got a good one going. My shop is going to have to get moved out of there at some point because the, the spaces are going to be, become too valuable. Um, and then overall, I think people really like it, other than the, the smells that we create sometimes. <laughs> Um, thank you, Brad. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I'm going to hand over 